So today's topic, running with power. Uh, Crowey, you've seen a lot of technological advances and triathlon always leads the way. Talk a little bit about the value of the whole concept of running with power. Well, it's a new concept and I think what we're seeing now is when power came into cycling as well, we're just trying to figure out how we can use it effectively, what it measures, what it means, and I mean the ultimate goal is to go quicker, right? So, um, you know, I think there's huge value here in not only analysing training and prescribing sessions moving forward, but also uh, from a technique standpoint, I think where I see the big advantage in running with power over cycling with power, when you're cycling, <coughs> obviously you're anchored on the seat and your feet are locked in. Uh, when you're running, you, you, could, you can go anywhere and what we often see is as you fatigue, your, your technique breaks down. So I think, you know, the combination of <coughs> looking at someone's, I guess, fitness parameters with, with the technical data that we can get, I think there's huge scope to use it moving forward in, and looking at, I mean, you can be limited by a lot of things. It can be your heart and lungs, so your cardiovascular fitness, your biomechanics, your technique. And so I think it can lead us from a coaching perspective, look at where an athlete's limitations are and, and that can drive the training moving forward and also with injury prevention from a technique standpoint as well. So, so Jimmy, you've, when you were researching this book, this is a totally brand new topic. So when VeloNews said, when you go to VeloPress and say, let's do a book or they come to you, uh, in terms of coming up with the research on something that is so new, how tough was that and, and what did you learn in the process? Yeah, well, when I started, I was like, oh, this will just be a, just like Joe Friel's book. You know, I can just basically take the table of contents and redo that, and it'll be simple. And what I found was that very quickly, it was not that at all. There's just like, like Crowey says, there's so much uh, movement that you have. And so you, you have all this ineffective power that's not necessarily moving you forward, where uh, in cycling, we're all used to this effective power number. The power meter tells me how many watts I'm producing to propel myself forward, and that's the number we care about. Well, in running with in running with power, it's not all necessarily that. It's more about speed per watt. So the whole concept had to change. It wasn't necessarily about. I think Crowley said it best. You know, at the end of the day, you still want to get faster. It's about getting faster. So uh, really, really understanding what it, what does power mean, and it's really enhanced. It's enhanced pace as a metric, and it's also enhanced our ability to to gain insight and in training and. You know, I think with uh, with what Stride's doing, they're they're even coming up with new stuff that I couldn't even do in my book because it's literally so new. <laughs> so it's uh, it's been that interesting. Give me an example of somebody who coaches you. Coach young kids, you coach juniors, and you're you also work with age group athletes and, and pros. Give me an example of how this has helped somebody you work with. Well, I think I think it's seen athletes know that they can hold a higher work rate over time. So that's even when necessarily they're not able to get that much faster, they can realize, well, the breakdown's not as, not as severe. Um, so that's certainly been something we've seen. Um, also, you know, just looking at some of the new stuff they've got with the, the pod, the foot pod, I think uh, we're gonna be able to see leg stiffness improvements and, you know, so much of running is through the soleus and the ankle joint. So, you know, so many good swimmers, we often wonder why can't they run very quickly and it's usually loose ankles so no springiness so you can actually now look at uh you know attack that in your training and, and strength training and other training and see how that progresses and i mean and then there's direct correlation so jamie when you uh, in terms of starting stride and coming up with the concept and then taking it to, to fruition what were some of the challenges you faced and in terms of innovation it seems like every single day things are changing so much Talk a little bit about where you've come and where you're going. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as uh, Bob said, I'm a co-founder of Stride. Um, we've been working on this technology now for many years. Um, the strength of Stride, I think, comes from the team and the expertise that, it, uh, that uh, the different members have. We're very complimentary. We're small, but we're complimentary. And uh, we've leveraged the expertise of uh, you know, world-renowned uh, exercise physiologists and biomechanists and coaches, such as uh, Dr. Andrew Coggan and uh, Steve McGregor, uh, Bobby McGee. Um, one of the challenges, I think, uh, that we ran into uh, was just getting data. Um, as we've been talking about uh, power from a human body, measuring that is very difficult. Um, it's the body's flexible. It's freedom of, of range of movement is huge, and we need to account for that um, in all the different directions. Understand that. Um, 
so in order to do that, uh, we're, uh, we have expertise in, in physics and um, you know, biomechanics, as I said. And so we have uh, models from, from that that we're able to uh, derive running power from based on how you move through space. Uh, we're measuring the, uh, you, your body in high resolution, its, its movement patterns. Um, we're adding in um, the effect of your uh, biomechanics in your running form. And, um, and then we're also saying there's a huge range of different runners um, in both style and body type and ability. And so what we needed to do to help refine the model, th the biggest challenge probably was collecting enough data to really understand how each different uh, you know, type of runner or uh, a person is gonna be generating power. So how, making sure that that number is accurate. So I think, yeah. yeah. So we move around here. Um, Frank, I'll toss this uh, to you. For, from uh, your perspective, your background going way back with swimming, and swimming is so technique oriented. How has this technology, how have you used this in, in your training for I mean, the people that you're training? So um, I think I, ca I came in the picture as, as, as advisor for Craig through many years, but when Stride, they wanted him, you know, he, s he went like, Frank, you're with, <laughs> and I went like, oh, oh. Because, but the unique thing for us was that we, we were one of the rats, I think like <laughs> lab rats. <laughs> and, and that means that we work from a theory in San Diego that in running anyway, that it, every movement starts from your head. So if we, if we assume that's right, then what we did and what is unique with Craig, some other athletes also, is that we could go out and Craig is actually very, very good at at doing a movement if you tell him try to do like this and he will do it. So what we wanted to find out was the efficiency in it because the power is not like on a bike. The more power you produce, if it's if it's on a velodrome or a wind still, the more power you're producing, the faster you go in that position you're sitting on a bike. That is not the case with this. You need to look at it together with your speed. So it's not just about producing as high no power number as possible because it comes a breaking point that we have seen what we called the movement threshold. When you're actually starting to spend too much power and your speed is not going with. Now that is a very unique thing with this for everybody to know your movement threshold. We always like VO2 max in the 30s and then in the 70s we went like we go into the blood and we go like lactic threshold but now we can actually see a movement threshold that's when your power is going up but your speed is not following and you do not want to enter that area so with Craig we made some tests like we went out and go like okay what are run coaches saying they go like you have to drive your knee forward well let's try it Craig and we made a baseline on his normal run and then we went like now try and run with driving your knee forward now try and run with your arms like now try and run like this. Now try and do all these advices that we hear again and again. And with this power measure, we could see what works, what doesn't work. So back to the point is that if it starts in your head and you're out on Queen K and it's falling apart, which movement do you want to think of that makes you go as fast as possible using less power? Your efficiency. We worked a lot on that. Does it make sense? Okay. So th that's... That was great. And, and just to, to follow up, actually, and, and Dr. Coggin is on, uh, on Skype with us. Dr. Coggin, did you want to jump in a little bit about what, uh, what Frank was just talking about? I think all of the uh, presenters are hitting upon a common theme, and that is interpreting power data for running is not as simple as it is for cycling, as Jim was the first to point out. But at the same time, it's highly valuable information uh, when you interpret it uh, correctly or, or uh, carefully. Um, it adds context beyond just knowing your pace. Um, the other thing, and this is really Steve McGregor's point, um, uh, while power is the sum of everything that you're doing and is familiar to uh, cyclists, for example. Um, stride and devices like the Stride are really best viewed as, again, as Steve describes it, as a, a portable biomechanics laboratory. Uh, so it's not just power that you're measuring, but many things related to how you move. Uh, and so, as Frank was saying, 
uh, you know, having that knowledge, monitoring it in real time can provide uh, useful insight uh, to allow you to you know, fine tune your training and your racing performance. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Coggan. Hey, Crow, you, you, like um, Frank was just saying, you guys were sort of the guinea pigs, and you were the guinea pig. What did you learn from that, from when doing the analysis, and that you actually transferred into your into your racing? Well, what I always knew that it's a very technique-based discipline, running, and that you're trying to go fast as efficiently as possible. So it was interesting. We. <clears throat> I mean, for instance, running up, and up a hill, even trying to run uphill easily, your power number would go up. And if you wanted to run uphill fast, it would go way up. But running downhill, it was easy to go fast and, and keep the number low because obviously gravity's pulling you. But I think for me, there were implications in terms of you know, how you would use it. And I haven't trained for an Ironman for nearly three years now, but I think it would be very useful not only for your pace and threshold or tempo sessions, but also for your long runs to see at what point potentially your energy requirements or demand goes up and the pace goes down. And, you know, that'll give you insight into whether it's a, a cardiovascular limitation or perhaps strength and conditioning you need to implement in your training program. Um, so we didn't really use it a lot. I mean, it's the, the product's still developing and we're still learning, but... I mean, I've always been a huge believer in, you know, any, any event or, or sport that's based on repetitive motion. It's not really about speeding up to have a good um, income, um, outcome. It's about not slowing down. It's about holding form. And, you know, I think the information that you get from, from the stride meter can, can really be useful in your training to help you, you know, I mean, I guess as a professional athlete, you have a lot of time to train, but a lot of people don't. So what is the most important thing that you need to implement in your program? I think you can get good insights into that from the, from the power meter. The other, the other side of that, obviously, is, is we have a, an aging, a lot of triathletes are older, right? And the one thing that breaks people down is the running. So, Jimmy, how important is it to, to become more efficient as a runner so that you, you can run longer, uh, you can run, you continue to run, but also run more efficiently so you don't have to train as much in the running portion, especially as a triathlete? Well, I think every runner, whether they're a triathlete or a runner in general, is trying to get intensity right and learning how to measure that intensity and pace. What we found is just not a very effective tool for measuring intensity overall. And so, you know, with your own hilly courses or flat courses, things of that nature, or interval sessions can be very difficult to really measure what the load was. And a power meter suddenly, because you have all these movements, can tell you what, what the actual training stress was on you from a, from a session. And that data over time especially begins to see where, where you're, and if you track that with your paces and that you're focused on, and you begin to see, you really, you really begin to understand training stress and training response very clearly. And, and then retrospectively, at the end of a season, you can go back and say, we overcooked it here. This was too much training stress you know, here, and this we got injured here, or things like that. And I, I don't know a single runner that doesn't deal with some type of injury or, or issue. So the ability to measure intensity has greatly, greatly improved for runners with power meters. With the runners you work with, or the triathletes you work with, do you do a lot of work with them as just during, or having them run fresh and then run after a bike and notice and compare the difference between their their form and their technique? Well, that's a great question. And quite honestly, the answer is we don't know yet. Now, this is still such new technology. There, you know, we can say on a on a bike the pros should be the TSS for the bike should be around 280. 300 we know that number that's that's pretty solid bike ride and what we can expect we don't have that in running and especially it's not even about that because they're already they're so neurologically fatigued coming off the bike that we can't really expect them to be very efficient in their movement patterns and things so we don't have a number for that yet um, I think over time as we I know I think they're gonna have a number of athletes Saturday racing with it this will be the real first chance for us to start to see what do we notice who's breaking down that data and really learn learn what's going on uh, following up with that so oh I'm sorry Frank might I toss something in it sure go ahead Andrew a uh, little background I'm a cyclist not so much a runner but uh, 27 years ago, I crashed in a criterium, fractured my hip, and it's uh, 
problematic for me if I run too much. More recently, though, I've been running on a treadmill every single day and haven't had any problems. Um, of course, treadmills have a reputation for being more forgiving uh, springier. But one of the things I've learned from using the, uh, the stride and calculating leg stiffness uh, and also ground impact forces is that I can actually quantify the difference between running on the treadmill versus running out on the road. And so, you know, not surprisingly, I don't hit the, I don't hit the, the bed of the treadmill quite as hard as I hit the ground when I run, et cetera. But I think this is the, the same sort of general information that you'll be able to see if you compared somebody training when fresh versus training off the bike, that the, the stride device provides uh, a wealth of information about you know, precisely how you are running and how it is influenced by things such as not only the surface that I'm using as an example that I'm running upon here, but also fatigue, et cetera. So, um, you know, in short order, I mean, the, the, the hardware is there. I think in short order, uh, the knowledge will be there as well. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Frank, did you have a... Yeah, so we, to be a scientific thing, I think you have to, Jim and, and Dr. Kogan will probably, but just on a small scale, I've already done it on track. So if, what we are very interested in half Ironman and full Ironman coaching in our place is not, we are very, very interested in getting from A to B as fast as possible, but spending as little energy as possible. And that's where, like Jimmy says, now we can measure it. And we've been testing it and like that. So on some of the pro athletes that we have, we, we're very, very interested when they get off a training ride of five hours. So we look at how many kilojoules that they spend on this five hours from the power meter, fine. And then we put them on and just do track, track repeats. You've got to be in a place where there's no wind because else it starts again. The power will, of course, you have to break the wind and then your power will go up. So on wind still days, so we actually done it over six months with a very good runner down in Brazil. And we have seen. And then when we go into the track and do like 30 times 800, with 200 jog between. And then we just look all the time and just ride and ride and ride and we just go like, oh, is the power going up and how is the speed going? So that gives us an indication. Then what we do is we go in after 10 rounds and we go like, okay, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking I'm tough. Well, that's not gonna help you. It's gonna help you get to the finish line. It's not gonna create a movement. So we're going like, that's good. Keep being tough, but we know you're tough. What movement are you gonna think of the next 10 rounds? And then he thinks of these 10, this movement like it can be like okay shorter arms to get a higher cadence because the arms and legs they go together whatever and then we see again is the power dropping a little bit and the speed stays constant and then we get some data that we can go like now my friend when you're out there in queen k i want you thinking about your arms when you're starting to go like whoa do your arms that works it keeps you efficient so he's there, there you get one tool straight away and it so it, it is you can use this straight away in that way yeah, sure, Jim, go ahead. So in my book, Run With Power, I, I talk about a type of run that does that exactly called envelope running, where you kind of push the speed, uh, I call it pushing the envelope basically, where you're holding back and you're doing, making changes to your technique and, and seeing how that power to speed ratio goes. And uh, well, I was doing, I've been doing this with athletes long before power meters, but now really the athlete can even see, okay, well, even though my speed maybe didn't improve, the watts to produce that speed have declined, so that's that that in itself shows uh, more that, yeah more efficiency. The exact exact thing uh, Frank's talking about. So yeah, that's in the book as well. So Jamie, uh, Jim was mentioning that on Saturday you're going to have some people trying out trying out the product. This is really the you know really the first time that people will be able to do that at at the Ironman. Talk a little bit about the acceptance that you're getting from the triathletes and and what you are doing on Saturday. Yeah, um, so we are going to be monitoring, um, well, monitoring, we're going to have devices uh, on the, from the, these are the, by the way, this is, I'm wearing one, it's a, a foot pod power meter. So our, our flagship product, which we launched with last year, is called the Pioneer. It's a chest pod power meter combination with heart rate monitor. And what we're doing now is, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, if you want to stick around, I'll have a, a 10 minute talk on it right after this panel. Uh, it's. Uh, we're really doing a deep dive now on uh, efficiency and uh, economy, and we're trying to understand um, how to re how to focus on that part and reduce that part. And so that's that's the focus of, of the foot pod. 
of course, it does still provide overall power, but the, for the first time, we can actually separate um, your metabolic power cost uh, from your form, essentially the power cost of your running form, which you can change and essentially you can improve um, your running economy if you improve that. So, um, so what we're doing on Saturday is we're going to be having uh, both pros and amateurs run with the new foot pod power meter. And then uh, we're going to collect all that data and really dive into it and, uh, and show it to you all as well and, and just see what we see. Obviously, this is all new technology. What do you see a year from now that, uh, that we'll be using at this race that, that isn't out there yet? So one, one of the other things we're working on is personalized training. And if, the idea is if we can uh, understand what, it is your, what your goal is and what, how much time you have to reach that goal, um, and then understand where, uh, essentially where your weaknesses are. So if we can um, use the power meter to essentially baseline you, figure out what your economy is. There's been some talk so far of, of leg stiffness um, where, where this foot pod power meter is going to deliver that. We're going to be able to hopefully um, deliver a personalized training plan um, with specific plyometrics, uh, strength training, maybe uh, hill climbs and things like that, tailoring your workout to you to increase your running economy and therefore make you faster. So. I would say the personalized training plans is the is the thing on the horizon that we're and again this is brand new this is why we need you guys to help us and to uh, you know to to generate data and work with it see what works what doesn't but that this is brand new and that's that's kind of on the horizon. Are you seeing that the triathletes, as usual, are the are the early adopters uh, rather than a lot of times the individual sports guys, the swim, swimmers, cyclists, and runners are sort of later to the game. Um, do you see that the, the triathletes might ad adapt to this quicker than the running world, the straight running world? Absolutely. Um, you know, triathletes are data savvy. Um, I don't know what it is, but they just get data. They want data. They know the value of it. Um, so one, as another metric power, um, it's one metric, but as another one, it's, it's natural to see it and, underst and understand it, especially for the triathlete that uses it on their bike already. So. That's, uh, that's been natural. Um, runners, on the other hand, um, they're, uh, especially the ones really keen to improve, have been early adopters. Um, those who are competitive, um, maybe just on the weekends, or just want to improve, essentially want to have a better PR, want that edge. Um, so because the other thing is we're accessible. Uh, you know, a power meter on a bike is fairly expensive still, where um, you know, we're about the cost of a, um, a pair of running shoes. So. So, so Crowy, for uh, you, you've been here as power meters became common in cycling, right? Back, back in the day, that it, it wasn't it was wasn't as common. You saw a change in how people ride the bike. Do you see that as that's going to happen here as well? Absolutely, and I think not only with the the training benefit, I think racing with it and being able to pace yourself. I'm not sure if it was Jim's book or an article Jim had written about running on an undulating course and being able to try and be efficient and, and maintain a steady power. You know, you can do that subjectively, but it, wouldn't it be great to have objective data and set your race plan that way? So I, I think there's, there's applications here, not only with the training, but also in racing. And yeah, I mean, the first time I ever trained with a power meter was in 07 on the bike, when I stepped up to Ironman, because I thought it would help make my training more structured and specific, and you know exactly what you're doing with every session. I think the same is true here, but to speak to all the points that the guys have made. It's about collecting data. I mean, you're asking us how to use it. I think we're still learning. Um, I mean, I would be interested to do, for instance, a set of eight one-mile repeats and look what that power number is and how it changes throughout. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and also it would be interesting to run maybe a, a loop, a five or six-mile loop, and, and also do it later in the week off the bike and see what happens to your efficiency. Uh, maybe you need to run off the bike a lot more. That, that's where your weakness is. But I think the information you can get can give you insights to not only your training, but also inju injury prevention and, and, and your strategy for race day as well, pacing and, and things like that. Uh, Dr. Coggan, did you have anything to add on that? I was just about to jump in. As I'm, I'm <laughs> I had a feeling. To do. <laughs> I, I think Craig Crowey has actually an excellent point there in that while uh, having this data available, it's still early days, 
um, for for the people who are technically oriented enough to eventually you know, take advantage of it, um, it's actually you know it, 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 there's much to be said for starting sooner with collecting data rather than later. I mean, yes, there's still applications of the knowledge to be sorted out, but you know if you delay and delay and delay, you're basically giving a head start to your competition. Um, whereas, wouldn't it be great if you said, well, I'm going to be an early adopter, and fortunately, running power meters are not nearly as expensive as cycling power meters used to be back in the day. But you could sit there and say, I'm going to be an early adopter, and I'm going to start collecting data. And so when two years or three years or whatever down the road, uh, by 2020, uh, for the Olympics or something, where people say, yes, we've discovered that you know this is the, uh, I won't say optimal, but this is a very useful application for it, et cetera. You, know, you have a, a database on yourself that you can go back and look at. Um, so. Perfect, I, thanks. I do, I do think there is something to be said for you know getting in early uh, if you want to try and get an edge on your competition. And Jimmy, speaking of getting in early, you work with juniors and being able to basically analyze somebody's running from the very beginning when they're first getting into the sport, that seems to be a, a huge advantage because you've, you've got a baseline right from their, right when they're first getting into the sport. Yeah, and unfortunately, though, we're still, we're still kind of at that point where it's hard to draw conclusions from it, you know, because like one, I can tell you the one great thing about working with kids, it's pretty hard for them not to improve <laughs> because <laughs> just being consistent, uh, they do well. So, you know, but I think, and, I, and this, is, this is what it all comes down to, and even in the book, I talk about collect the data first. And then see what your your individual specifics are. How what well, how does it apply to you? So it's hard for us right now in this new phase to really make a generalized statement of of this is the number you want to be at or this is that. And and so I think really this this allows you to individualize your training and and really see specifically for yourself. And that's at any age level, any ability level, elite to beginner. So. Uh, Certainly, its 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 effectiveness will only continue to grow as that data collection grows. A lot of times, when you write a book, you never know what's going to resonate with people, right? Which parts? So, with this book that's been out for a little while, what is there anything surprised you that people have responded to? Oh, sure. I think I think uh, a lot of people really using the training plans, the the power zones, uh, really understanding uh, the what I call EI, which is the speed per watt, basically. And so what it does is, you know, and, and really saying, okay, if this is my pace off the bike or in, a, in an open half marathon or whatever, how is, oh, and these are my workouts targeted to that, how is my speed per watt improving over time? So that's been really effective. I've gotten great feedback on that. And then in some ways you have some people that are, are very traditional and think, think anything beyond a normal Timex watch or something is is too much so you know but uh, what I what I think people are beginning to see though is technology is useful in almost every part of our life you know whether you have a you know, smartphone to you know the internet at home and the way you use it so I think people are starting to really a adapt with and adopt this technology and in and see the value since they use it in so many other areas of their life uh, Jamie for when, when you launch stride and you're you're looking to expand the brand and the concept there's a big universe out there. What will be your the marketing plan? What will be where will you be targeting over this next 12 months? Well, I mean, we are a business, so we do have you know some sure. things like marketing plans and launching plans. But actually, I mean, I would say that the team fundamentally is passionate about making people faster. That is the goal. Um, we're in the long haul for this, and. We're realizing that, well, yeah, it is. We're in, still in the beginning stages. We did you know, launch last year. We updated uh, the device, and we're launching again. And um, you know, we'll be targeting um, you know, just whoever wants to get faster that's interested in data and getting data and working with us. And uh, that's one of the things we've done uh, over the last year. We, did, we actually started this on Kickstarter back in, in March of last year. Yeah, and so 
we had you know a thousand backers we, we wanted to keep it at a thousand why because we wanted to work hand in hand with every one of those thousand coaches and athletes and so it, it we realized that this is a, a big this is a big thing this is a big idea it has the potential for revolutionizing the way people train while running and, and revolutionizing uh, their improvement I mean, that's that's what we believe so in order to do that such a big idea like that it's not something we can do alone so it's 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 really about partnering with all of you guys and uh, you know getting data and refining the process refining how to use it um, injecting it into training plans so that we quantify you know the best way essentially what we're doing here is we're optimizing your body's adaptation to to your goal we, we don't want to overtrain that's where injuries come we don't want to undertrain because that's not optimal for you so we want to take who you are where you're at and systematically understand the best way to get you to where you want to be and and that's that's a team effort essentially that's just a big idea so I mean that's that's what we're that's what we're doing All right. so uh, Frank if there been a I mean, you said that crowe has been your number one guinea pig have you worked with a, another athlete or two and seen some success that you could share with the group yeah and and, and I think that's 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 where and again, I say that I I am a true believer. I'm I'm t I'm waiting when Dr. Kogan and Jim is going to write two years or three years from now when they have all that data. But we're just working with it already. So we are not like I I can't say that if this goes for everybody do like this. That's what they're going to say in two years and now. But what we can say is that, for instance, we have a run at home where I have ten runners and we go like okay, we're running one hour out, and we're not using the watches and we have had the p these power meters and two persons. And then it's by feel home, but they got to hit the same marker after one hour. And, and again, after we talk about, so some people they actually run extremely well by feel. This power meter helps us again to identify in a group of 10 person who's running very well on feel, who has to have a pacing and who doesn't need a pacing. Those who doesn't need a pacing, some people get stressed about it. But so for us, it's, I see this one very much like as a coach, I see it that we're using it in training. We're going to see on, s on Saturday, p some people are riding with power meters and some are not. On race day, some people get enormously stressed by the power meter and some people cannot ride without it. But we just, it, for everybody, it's usable to understand what you're doing in your training. That's what we have seen. But as an example of a get it now, go out tomorrow and run, if you have two kinds of running shoes, one very lightweight and one like maybe the Hoka, the, the thick, or the Newton one, you have three pairs of running shoes. Okay. Go and run on a track, run the same pace, change the shoes, see how much power you use. That's going to take you two hours, and after that, you know which shoes are best for you. It's a very practical thing. That <laughs> what I said to you is very simple. You can do it when you <laughs> do it on Sunday morning. Those of you who are racing, then it's not <laughs> it's not going to be so easy. But it's a very simple thing we have done for people who go to a shop and they go, "This is the shoes for you," and they come to me as a coach and say, "You think it's the shoes for me?" And now I can say, "Let's go and try." You know, so that we have just come up with again and again very practical, simple things that we that w that's what we're doing now. And what uh, Craig was talking about the thing about running heels, and Jim has, has touched it in the book. So for those of you racing here, you're gonna put it your bike in T2, and I think we touched it last year. So running heels is a great thing to understand, and it's one of the keys why Craig is the three-time world champion. He is a natural downhill runner. He knows how to run downhill. But what most people they're going to do on, on out on Alihi Drive is they're going you're going to push too hard going up because running up when you just put the bike is it's very easy and there's a lot of people so everybody push too hard and your your body temperature is going to go up then you push too hard going up then when you're running down you go oh, pff, I got to relax a little relaxing running down here means you're going to lean fo backward and your legs are going to go forward so you're breaking you're you're hammering your legs running down you got to do opposite you, and that you can use the power meter for again. You can see it on the power meter. I stay cool, I stay cool going up. And then when you get up to the top, you, you run down. You don't relax down, you run down. It's going to give you the most fresh legs when you come out of energy lab going home. And it's going to give you the best in time. And the crazy, Craig, he knows that, but I've seen it with him. It's one of the reasons he won here. He ran down. So. Thank you. Andrew, do you have something to add there? Uh, only. only I would say, I mean, you could think of this as energy management or pacing, and I would, I would actually have to confess that I really underestimated the 
usefulness of power in that context. Um, I mean, cycling or cross-country skiing, I describe them as free-range activities. You know, uphill, downdale, environmental conditions uh, vary dramatically. So, of course, knowing your actual physical power output is uh, very useful um, compared to just looking at pace. Uh, then when running power meters were introduced, um, and I even said this to, uh, again, Steve McGregor, you know, a decade or so ago as these ideas are kicked around, um, I envisioned runners running on flatter terrain, doing structured efforts, you know, on a uh, track, et cetera. And I did not uh, recognize the utility. But now if you start talking about um, uh, running power has gotten especially popular <coughs> with trail runners because they do uh, go up and down a lot more or as uh, Frank was just talking about trying to manage pace uh, where the environmental conditions are challenging such as Kona um, I, you know, certainly it's uh, very useful in that context to have an objective measure of your actual uh, activity. Um, and again, this was something I had not really in, uh, recognized uh, going in. Perfect. We Thanks. can all learn, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Jamie, I know you have a presentation you want to do at, what, about 350-ish, something like that. Any questions from you guys out there? From, on, yes, sir. That's a really good point, uh, asking about collecting data. Go ahead, Jamie. So, great question. The ecosystem, is it mature and ready? Um, so it's a brand new thing, as we said, as of last year. And what we've done is we sort of hacked the ecosystem in the meantime. What we're seeing now, because uh, you have people in certain cases uh, running with cycling mode and things so we get power um, on the, in their watches, depending upon uh, which watch they're using. But what we're seeing, we're in contact with uh, you know, all the uh, big platform makers. Um, and, you know, it's coming. It's something that is not, I would say, completely mature yet, but it's something that uh, will get there with time. And it is an ongoing process that we're working uh, with all these uh, platform makers. That said, there's also Stride has uh, tried to remedy this by having our own power center, which is uh, uh, kind of, you know, a, an offline data repository that you can use to analyze your, your, your runs. Um, and that's available. Um, and then we just try as best we can to advance the processes as, as fast as we can. But I would not call it a perfectly mature system yet. Um, did you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, like the rats. <laughs> so when we were trying to, to analyze some of the data, I actually, I agree with you that we have had, sometimes we have contacted Stride and going like, where can we get this to look at? And we have had it. I actually, I actually liked it. Some of those that I, I tested it on, some athletes and like that. We actually liked that when we opened it, it was not like full of numbers, that it was limited. So again, like maybe it's a question that you're with from the beginning. Now, if you go in and take bike data now, where are you going to analyze it? You get on one website, you get 500 numbers and you get different graphs and like, you don't get that now. So it's, it's pretty simple, but it's usable in my opinion. I mean, I, we used it for six months, nine months, and it's usable. It'll develop, but I think in two years, you're going to have different platforms everywhere. You buy this one, and where am I going to go? I like when it's simple sometimes, actually. That, that if it's reliable like it is, and it's simple, then within three months, it comes a new platform. Okay, a new number. Okay, then let's look at that. And then a new one. Let's look at that. But as it is now, the power number works, in my opinion, from testing it. Any other questions out there? Yes, sir. So I can repeat it. So yeah. you're a Stride user since November of last year. Yeah. You're creating lots of data, and you're hoping that we're mining it yeah. to learn from it. And the answer is yes. I mean, that's so we're, we're trying to so we're we're trying to work with our athletes and coaches in two ways. One is to learn from them and how they use it and what works for them. So you know, in your training, what are you doing in your training? How are you using power, and how does it work for you? Tell us. That way we can help to incorporate the tools that you need, like in the power center, to get the most out of that uh, process. And then the other point, as you said, is data mining. So we can actually improve um, 
the whole the whole system essentially from top to bottom. And so, yeah, I mean, we 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 do data mine and 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 you know do analysis across our users to see, you know, where are we going wrong, uh, where are we going right, and where is there opportunity to do even better, so that we can understand and and pass all that on to to you guys so that you can get the most out of your training. So that's that is the idea. Well, that's like I said. That's what our goal is as a team. We're really passionate to get it to work and get it, uh, and and just move it forward, really. And so, I mean, w that's that's our goal. So, and, you know, that's how working. That's an example of working closely with an athlete to get you know the most that we can and learn the most that we can and and progress as fast as possible. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. There you go. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, will, what, what's on the horizon for getting a, a, a handle on efficiency that's user-friendly and understandable and, and repeatable and usable? Um, so two things. One is the Connect IQ app that we've developed has a zone bar, so you can see color-based where you are based on your zone. So they're personalized zones. If you've done a critical power test, which is essentially an FTP test, then we'll know, we'll derive what your zones are. Um, from you know highly intensive zone five down to recovery zone one, and then if you have a workout scheduled for zone three, you can see based on color if you're there or not where you are, and so that's one of the ways that I think would be helpful. Um, and then the other thing is uh, with the new foot pod, our focus is on uh, running efficiency and and giving you we're we're providing um, one of the components of power, which is the power due to running form. We call it form power. Um, which is also um, related to your leg stiffness. And so we can see how that changes over time as well. So that's, a, that's another thing that we're doing on the horizon to help you understand where to get, you know, to help you, you can, you can even try things and see how does uh, what I'm doing right now, the way I'm changing my form affect my power, affect my form power. And so those are, those are some of the things I can say. So there, there's been a lot of questions about just using it, using and, and analyzing the data. So these these are growing all the time. I know WKO4 from Training Peaks is expanding and it's using the community with people creating charts. I think Golden Cheetah is another one that's expanding. I wrote the book using only Training Peaks online. Um, and if you're really just looking to measure training of you know training intensity, that works great. Um, and that's really what I focused on the book with. And then there's even little apps. I mean, this is the great thing that technology has done. It's, it's allowed all of us to communicate and contribute. Uh, people, people email me and say, hey, I created a, this on the, on the Garmin IQ store. It's your rolling EI, you know, that you wrote about in the book. I'm like, that's cool. And then another one, somebody did it in, for Sunto and Sunto's thing. So that, that community is growing by the you know, by the week. Uh, so uh, I, would, I would only expect that to continue. Um, and then I think as this, as this data and technology continues to be proven, you know, to the, and, and adopted by many, then, then the, those platforms will also continue to, to improve the, their offerings as well. 